The opinions expressed in this program are not those of CESA 7 or Time Warner Cable. Statement. We educate all students to be college, career, and community ready, inspired to succeed in our diverse world. Thank you, Mike. The next is our open forum. This is a time for members of the community to speak before the board about any issue of concern. I have no forms filled out today, um, but if, is there anyone who would like to speak before the board? Seeing none, then we'll move on to um, the roll call. Sandy? Excuse. Warren? Here. Wagner? Here. Blacka? Here. Maloney? Here. Becker? Here. Chang? Here. Arnoldi? Here. We have uh, six board members present, one excused. I'm joined at the table to my left by Dr. Michelle Langenfeld, our superintendent, our board secretary, Sandy Heller, and two intercity uh, student council board uh, members, Lokin Chang, who's president and represents Preble, and McKenna Arnoldi, who comes from uh, John Dewey Academy. So welcome and feel free, and McKenna, you haven't been here before, but if you have questions or want to make comments at any point, feel free to do that. Then next we have um, minute board, uh, minutes of prior board meetings to approve. I'll entertain a motion to approve the following minutes. A regular board meeting, October 20th. Special board meetings, October 27th, November 10th. Closed sessions, October 20th and November 3rd. And our uh, public hearing for our budget, which was October 22nd. Seven. Seventh, sorry. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And then next we have our communications. We do have one letter to be placed on file today. I'll entertain a motion to do that. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carried 6-0. And then we have our monitoring reports, and that will be facilitated by Mike Blecka. Thank you, Brenda. Uh, Mark and Stephen Miller join us at the table. Um, and the first thing Stephen is going to have to explain is why we're now calling it the Badger exam. <laughs> I was going to get to that. I was hey, thinking well, in honor of the, the big bat. victory on Saturday. Yes. That's right. <laughs> should be the, the, should be the Melvin Gordon exam? Or? Melvin Gordon the third. Yes. Through eight. <laughs> well, I hate to, uh, to sign me the excitement here to get to the Badger exam, but I provide a little bit of context. Um, uh, just again, uh, for the members of the, uh, the viewing audience and also for the Board of Education, we've organized these reports in the form and fashion around learning initiatives. Uh, previously, we've come to you to talk about the Common Core of State Standards and the work that we've uh, done to internalize that and make those the Green Bay School District uh, curriculum. Um, and we also had a previous presentation around our curriculum renewal process. So we've identified what it is that we want our students to know and be able to do. We talked about how we try to keep that process alive. One of the other questions that we continuously talk about is how will we know if our students have learned it? Uh, so the Smarter Balanced Assessment is one state assessment, uh, now called the Badger Exam. Uh, we have a plethora of other assessments, and as we talk about other learning uh, reports that come forward, that might be a, a conversation that we would entertain as well. So I'll introduce uh, Stephen Miller, the Director of Assessment, and he'll facilitate the uh, presentation today. We have uh, several slides, and then we'll open it up to uh, questions uh, for the Board of Education. So, Stephen? Okay. Thanks, Mark. 
So as Mark and Mike alluded to, the Smarter Balanced Assessment for the State of Wisconsin is now called the Badger Exam, three through eight. That's the actual technical name of the exam. And it is part of um, Wisconsin State Assessment System. And I will run through the presentation up on the overhead. Uh, as you may or may not know, there are a number of other assessments. And as Mark referred to, we will talk about some of those later. But I just wanted to give you an idea of how it fits in context with those other assessments. The Smarter Balanced Assessment is currently designed to roll out on March 30th uh, and run through May 22nd. It will be a window of time in which students can complete the assessment. And as they mentioned, uh, that change to the name Badger exam happened in the month of October, so it's relatively new. It will replace the English language arts and math elements of the WKCE. It's given in the spring, and it, has, it is an assessment that was designed uh, to assess student understanding and, and learning in the Common Core State Standards. May I ask a question, uh, technical question? It's replacing that. Is it the same amount of time for this, these exams as the previous exams? Uh, there is actually more time required on the Smarter Balanced Assessment than there was required on the previous WKCE. It works out badger. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. On the new badger exam. Yes, it is actually longer. It works out to be um, up well, well actually we'll talk about this because okay. it's that's a relevant question to ask on this slide because the WKC, uh, which was a fill in the bubble test, was very focused on content knowledge, students' mastery of specific <coughs> knowledge pieces, uh, and they had separate reading English and writing tests. With the smarter balance or, or the badger exam three through eight. Uh, it's going to be a computer adaptive test, which means that the problems will become more complex as students get them correct, and they will get easier as students get them incorrect. Uh, it will be skills focused, and information that's new as of the last couple of weeks is that it will also be untimed. Uh, they have recommended times that you should set up the testing, which work out to be about three hours for each exam at the elementary level in three and a half and three hours at the middle school level. However, there's a strong emphasis on the fact that it is an untimed assessment, meaning students can take as long as they need to to complete the assessment. We do not have at this time all the specific details of what that might look like. If a student starts part of the test, do they have to finish it in the same day? Uh, we don't know that today. Those technical details have not been provided to us. But what I can say to you definitively today is that DPI has shared with us that it is an untimed assessment. And that's new information. That because I attended your other workshop correct. on this, and that wasn't clear. In the last that was two a weeks. Because of the computer yes. component. In the last two weeks, we discovered that it will be an untimed assessment. So new information does become available, I'd like to tell people, daily uh, uh, as, we do, as we continue to implement the Badger exam. Stephen, maybe this is the good time to get into this or if you want to wait until later I would like you to talk a little bit about what principals and staff are doing with students who are not computer literate and I know we have lots of students who are don't have computers at home and are not as comfortable as other students which can affect their test taking would, would you talk about that because I think that's kind of a key issue I, I absolutely agree, and especially for our, our children in poverty who may not have the same uh, amount of computer experience in the yeah. home. Um, I, 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 would, I guess I would say as part of a comprehensive plan, our library media specialists and our technology integrators have been involved with looking at the Badger exam and figuring out what technology skills students need to have, mm -hmm. and then working with the <coughs> principals and the teaching staff mm -hmm. to make sure that students are exposed to and have opportunities to work with that kind of technology. I can give you a very specific example. One of the tools that we found uh, when we did the field testing last spring for what was then called the Smarter Balanced Assessment was just a little notepad that you can pull up to take notes as you're reading through an article. And when I get to the performance tasks, I'll talk a little bit about why that might be important. Our third, fourth, and fifth graders had absolutely no exposure to that kind of technology yeah. before. And so because now. If you're worried about how to navigate through this, your mind isn't on the content. The con yep. Sure. Yep. Yeah. It, we will um, be talking with our principals mm -hmm. on November 25th, actually, uh, about a plan yeah. moving forward. Uh, 
Well, I, I think I can circle back around. Maybe okay. I'll just provide a general overview, and then we'll kind of talk about some of the plans that we intend to implement. I'll ask it at the end. <laughs> Thank you, Brent. All right, so six item types to look for on the smart or the Badger exam three through eight. I still have to get myself to say Badger exam all the time. Selected response items, constructed response, extended response, technology enabled, technology enhanced, and then performance tests. I'm going to just give a brief overview of each of these types. If you have any questions, again, don't hesitate to ask. Selected response, typical to what you see in any standardized test where students are given some information and then they're asked to select the right answer, so A, B, C, or D. But then they also have multiple correct options for selected response, where students may have to select all that apply, which uh, is more typical. So if you exams. get, say there's three right answers there, you only get two, are you deducted for Absolutely. that? Absolutely, and if you guess incorrectly, you would be deducted as well. I can't say specifically for this problem, you know, how that would work, but uh, yes, you would you would get points off if you only picked two and three applied, okay. or right. if you picked four and only three applied, you would also get points taken off. Okay. <clears throat> then there's constructed response items. Again, this is not new. This was included in the WKC in the past where students would have information and then they would have to respond with a short answer. So nothing new in the standardized testing arena. But this would be an example of something that is a little bit newer and in response to the Common Core, mm -hmm. uh, where answers, where a problem might have multiple solutions. In the case of this problems, students are given some information about designing a rabbit pen, and then they have to actually come up with three different ways to design that rabbit pen. So there are multiple possible correct answers here. Technology enabled item, this would be a, an example of a technology enabled item where students would have something read to them. There would be audio involved. They would have to listen to a speech. Again, because of the untimed nature of the test, they could listen to the speech over. The voice over. on there was very familiar. I bet it was. Yeah. Well. For the record, that was an example that Stephen yes, uh, created yeah. for us. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah. Um, I took the text that they had because they provided text with it, yeah, but I thought okay. to try to make it more real. I mean, they actually listen to the audio, and then they have to decide which sentence should be omitted in right. order to make it a better speech. In this case, a technology enhanced, enhanced item, students would have to highlight uh, where this sonnet changes uh, in the speaker's message. So they would actually use the mouse. We talked about some of those skills. They would have to use the mouse, click, and highlight text in this case. Here's an example where they would have to use the mouse to draw a line um, on a graph. So again, providing that exposure for those items. Now, the, the newest kind of item, um, and probably the most difficult that, that I found for us to get our heads wrapped around, is a performance task. And in a performance task, there's actually a 30-minute activity, generally, that takes place in the classroom. Uh, in the case of this performance task, it's not quite 30 minutes, but the facilitator named here, which would be the teacher, actually goes through and talks about a lemonade stand. Um, we could also have a discussion about context. I don't know how many of our kids actually know what a lemonade stand is anymore, but again, this is just a sample problem provided by the Smarter Balanced Assessment Consortium. So the teacher talks a little bit about a lemonade stand, and then the kids go into the computer lab. When they go are to their kids, computer. Excuse me, Stephen. Are kids during this given any sort of exercise breaks, bathroom breaks? You know, that's pretty stressful. You sit here for a long time and without some kind of a break. Are teachers instructed to give students periodic breaks? Or? That will be part of what we roll out. Because of the, part of it is because of the untimed nature of the test. We've yeah. been told that the student could leave their computer for up to 20 minutes okay. and that the test would still stay active for them. If they leave for longer than 20 minutes, then the teacher would have to reactivate that test. That's one of the technical requirements we've been told. Um, so I, I would never put a kid in front of a computer for more than 60 minutes yes, at a stretch. A so time. we're going to be encouraging yeah. the idea of frequent okay, breaks, okay. Um, you know, changing the, an activity. And again, we don't know when a student starts a part of the test, yeah. will they have to finish that in one day or will they get multiple days to finish that? That information is not available yet but we will respond to that when we have that. Just as a follow-up, is the, the test security a little bit different because it levels? 
So in other words, the questions that I would get may be different than Brenda's, may be different, so there is less concern about stopping, taking a break. Or going in a bathroom together and sharing right. answers. Right, because you could be looking at very different questions. Is that why that seems to yep. be much yeah, more Yeah, there's a little relaxed. more flexibility there, especially on the computer adaptive task. Sure. Um, on the performance task, I don't know that there will be as much flexibility with regards okay. to that because the questions would be similar. And again, it's based on that experience that those kids have in the classroom. Um, and, and so it's not as flexible, but I know in the computer adaptive portion of the test, absolutely, you could have kids taking breaks, you know, and they wouldn't have the same test. They wouldn't be taking the same test. So problems will get more complex or easier, depending on how they respond. So students would see when they went into the lab, uh, this graph, and then they would have to use this graph to complete a table. And then what typically happens, and again, this is, it, this is based on the Common Core State Standards, students are given additional pieces of information, and they're asked to synthesize those pieces of information with previously provided information. So in this case, they're given information about uh, sales of lemonade relative to July. So they're, they're told the August <coughs> amounts relative to July, and now they have to fill in an additional table. Stephen, are all of these examples in here the same grade level, or did you mix them up? I mixed them up, but that's the hook. So two more slides, and I promise okay. I'll tell you. All right. Okay? okay. All right. All right. So then students are asked to, to create their own graph, their own pictograph, and to use cups to represent the number of cups of lemonade sold. And they have to actually pick, if you look, they have to actually pick their scale, so 4, 10, or 20 cups, so they have to determine an appropriate scale. So that was the third grade math performance task. Okay. I thought it'd give you a comment that it ties into the common uh, core standards, is that correct? Yes, it does. Okay. Yep. It is connected to the third grade common core state standards, which are very rigorous. They, yes. they, they simply are. Sure. It, that's it's critical. Uh, one, we go back and connect some of the dots. We talked about the Common Core being a more rigorous um, standard and in, in, in our floor for which we build things upon. And then we talked about the, the need to have a curriculum renewal process that allows those teachers the ability to really drill down to what it is that students not only need to know and be able to do, but then how do we instruct in a way that allows for that transference into another experience, um, because that is really what they're being asked to do on the assessment as well. That's a good point. So I thought, I thought I'd provide a sixth grade ELA example for a performance task as well, so you kind of see, you saw the math, we're going to take a look at the English language arts. In this case, students are given an article about robots to read. And then the teacher facilitates a pairs discussion and then a class discussion. So again, the students are given this article, they have to read it independently. Then they have a pairs, so they have a partner discussion. Um, they have to answer those three questions. And then there's a classroom discussion. Then again, students are brought into a computer lab. They're given a second article to read on the computer. So again, I talked about that idea of bringing up that notepad, taking notes on the computer. Students could do that if they wanted to. Uh, I do want to emphasize the fact that students are given unlimited scratch paper as well. So for those kids that they're more comfortable writing their thoughts out, they would have that option as well. Okay. They're given a third source article. So sixth grade, three articles, same theme. It's all about, you know, robots more or less. And then the first question they see is explain what source one, so the one they had in class, and source three, one of the ones that they were exposed to when they got to the computer lab, say about how robots are able to save lives by paraphrasing the information while <coughs> avoiding plagiarism. So our sixth graders have to know what plagiarism is. They have to know how to cite sources appropriately. Um, so those are skills that are important. Uh, you can see some of the key elements that they point out from source one and source three in the example. And then every performance task in English language arts ends with a writing prompt of some kind. 
The students, and again, this is aligned to the Common Core, the students will either have a narrative, a persuasive or opinion, or an informative essay that they're asked to write. And they do try to make them authentic tasks. In this case, they're asked to write a narrative for a technology club. But again, it's based on those three articles that they read. Michelle? But they're, they're rating, oh, you're gonna talk about that. That could be read. If I want to hear what that says in case my reading is not, or I read it and I want to make sure I understand, somebody can read that to me. Is that accurate? Yes. On my headset? Yes. Thank you. Absolutely. So our students will be in the lab with their headsets on. And again, relatively new information within the last two weeks. Uh, we do know that students in grades six through eight can have the whole test read to them. That's a change from what we've typically had in the past. In the past, uh, if it was on the reading test, you could not have problems read to you. But we were told by the Department of Public Instruction, again, within the last two weeks, that students in grades six through eight That's could great. have the reading test problems read to them. So, through the yes, you, through the computer. Would you also talk about how this affects and how, how ELL and special ed students are tested? Absolutely. So it was typical in the past for uh, our special education students to have extended time. Mm -hmm. uh, that's now uh, a, a, what they call a universal tool. That's available to every student. Um, testing in smaller environments, something we typically did with our English language learners or our special education students. We will have that option available for all students. The flip side of that then becomes, how do you deal with the capacity when you know that any kid could take an entire day to take the test, mm -hmm. theoretically? Mm -hmm. And the problems get more complex as, the, as right. they go on. Um, how do you figure out how to divide your staff up when giving the assessment so that you have optimal testing environments for every child, not just the students with an IEP or a 504 or English language learners, but every kid who might possibly need a smaller environment or even a one-on-one -on -one type of testing environment. Can we exempt any special ed students? Uh, there will be a small portion of the population that takes the dynamic learning maps assessment, uh, which replaces the Wisconsin Alternative Assessment for students with disabilities mm -hmm. for the ELA and the math portions. So it's about 1% of our population. Will this be in Spanish? This will be in Spanish? Well, what we've seen, and again, a lot of this is preliminary, but with the practice test, um, if you take the practice math test, they do have side-by-side side, side side English and Spanish translations. All right. Um, for a student whose English is not their first language, is there a point where a student is, say, seventh or eighth grade has been in our school system is there a point where a Hispanic student has to take it in English has DPI decided that if you have five years of learning in a one of our schools you should have enough English preparation to take it in English is that is that any kind of a requirement there or can that student who's a Hispanic always take it in Spanish DPI hasn't come out and made any statements specifically about that, but what's typically happened in the past on our assessments is that the student qualified for English language learner services, mm -hmm. so if they were a level one through five ELL student, mm -hmm. um, then it might be appropriate for them to receive questions in Spanish. So they haven't okay. said one way or the other how we do. How, okay. if, if there's going to be a cutoff date, you know, like they've been in the country for five I think years. think that's kind of a critical issue. Yep. Yeah. And internally, that's a process that both, you know, Claudia at her department and then Julie within the ELL department will work with Stephen to ensure that we have the appropriate modifications as allowed by, mm -hmm. you know, the, the test uh, as well. And we want to make sure that we provide the kids the appropriate um, accommodations so that they can perform in the most um, stress-free environment right. as possible. Okay, Brenda? <clears throat> Under designated support, it says uh, bilingual dictionary. Mm -hmm. uh, is that dictionary going to be available in more than just Spanish? We've been told that it will be available in multiple languages. Um, I have not seen the Arabic one yet. That's one that I asked for specifically with DPI. Um, I haven't seen one in Hmong yet, although I have seen Chinese. So um, 
I've asked for what I think would favor the students in our district, but I haven't been given definitive answers on whether or not all of those. The Spanish one I've seen as well. So some of them I have. I mean, there are some bilingual dictionaries available. They say that there will be more available by the time the test actually rolls out. I just haven't seen those yet, so I can't say for sure we'll have all of the languages represented in our district, but I have asked for those. Yeah, I mean, we need that, obviously. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. We want to give our students every appropriate advantage that we can on the test, knowing that many of our students who struggle with English as a second language are already at a disadvantage right. taking an English assessment. All right, so again, I, I put this slide up just to, to help emphasize the fact that that universal tools conversation has really become a part, a big part of the conversation now of how do we uh, take advantage of um, the opportunities we have with testing in those smaller environments or allowing our students to take it um, over multiple days potentially or using extended time in a single day to complete the assessment when that typically hasn't been the case in the past. And then I just wanted to show you a picture. These are students from Tank Elementary who participated in the field test last spring. Again, just to give you that feel, uh, you'll notice the carols uh, that are up around the computers because even though uh, each problem is different, one of the things we learned in our first year of field testing, which was two years ago, is that despite the fact that you give the students a security briefing, um, third graders may not always pay attention to everything you say. Really? And there will <laughs> there will always be one <laughs> who When does doesn't. that kick in? <laughs> there will always be that one child who says in the middle of the test, hey, his problem number five is not the same as my problem number five. Yeah. So kids like to share. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we do a lot of, yeah. of that collaboration Absolutely. in the classroom, so they get used to it, and sure. now we're trying to get them geared up to a different kind of environment okay. when we're doing a secure testing environment. So, you know, we've been working on uh, rolling out uh, appropriate headphones as well as these carols to kind of separate the devices okay. at each school to create an appropriate testing environment. Okay. And then I just included links in the presentation. Uh, if you're interested in taking a Smarter Balanced Practice test, you can follow that link um, at a later date. I'm not going to dig We gave it. you the PDF version, but if you'd yeah. like the, the live Google presentation, we could send it your way as well, which has the links there. So, And then there's also a link to the performance tasks for all the grade levels that will be tested, if you're interested in seeing what those look like. Okay. Andrew? Um, you don't get scored when you take the practice test though? You don't get a score back, no. You just have the opportunity to see what the problems look like. You can see what the correct answers are. There's a way to click on that. We can't. You can, you can see within it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else have questions? Chris? I'm more of a comment. It goes back, uh, Mr. Beckett, to your initial comment about those youngsters who don't have ready access to computers at home. Um, I don't think it's a question you can answer now, but I, I think we need to take a look at it. I mean, I really don't know, sitting here, about those youngsters who don't have access at home, how are they actually doing in school with computer usage? And it seems to me that question has to be answered in a hurry. If they're not doing well, we've got to do something in a hurry to get them comfortable with them. I think if, if I could offer just a comment um, and. I wouldn't be able to give you the specific answer to those individual students, but I can tell you that, you know, under Stephen's direction, we've we've taken advantage of a lot of our field test opportunities uh, for a couple reasons. We felt it was important to expose our kids to that environment. Also, gave us an opportunity to kind of. Um, you know, work out some of the pieces in terms of how how do how does the assessment perform on on hardwired devices versus uh, devices that are our laptops and have to access the the wireless network, um, and, and also given our teachers the opportunity to see what it is that the students will be exposed to. So as they uh, provide instruction and learning experiences, they can replicate some of these experiences as well. Um, additionally, our our principals over the last year have have taken. Um, under Stephen's direction a lot of these practice uh, tests so that they can see how they can lead within a system that has to leverage technology. Now couple that with our initiative to access devices, increase access to devices at the buildings that Diane has been uh, speaking about is really positioned as better um, for this. 
And yet I, th I think that we still can do more. You know, I, I really believe that there can be uh, a more outreach to uh, students and parents that, um, that, that provide them uh, the ability to take devices home, uh, as an example. Um, and, and, and that's the piece that we're looking at doing right now with our principals is really trying to troubleshoot. What do you see as your gaps in your building? And then how can we help support that? Uh, and we've had some examples with uh, ACT Aspire this year being tested at the high school level, uh, provided us a little bit of learning experience that we can come back and, and provide uh, those experiences with our elementary principals as well. Okay, Brenda? In the transition to Smarter Balance, our 10th graders took WKCE this fall. Was it just science? And, it just said it was science and yep, social just studies. Science, our 4th, 8th, and 10th graders took science and social studies for the WKCE. And then, so then in the spring, our 11th graders will take the Badger exam. Our 11th graders will take the ACT with, with writing and the work keys so assessment. Who, oh, that's right. They don't yeah. take a Badger exam in high school. No, three, 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 three through eight. Three, yep. Okay. Yeah, the system has really gotten, you know, we so, talk about complexity. The assessment system in Wisconsin yeah, has huge. really gotten a lot more complex so this year. So have we, we've lost reading and math then at WKCE in high school? Well, yes and no. Uh, the I mean, ACT Aspire, which all of the freshmen had to take right. this year, has <laughs> reading, writing, and actually a language okay. um, portion to the assessment, or an English portion to the assessment, as well as science and math. So the same five areas that are assessed on the ACT were assessed with the ACT Aspire freshmen. for all of our freshmen this spring, and will be assessed for all of our freshmen and sophomores in, in the spring. I'm sorry, I meant the freshmen were assessed in the fall. In the spring, all ninth and 10th graders will be assessed with the ACT Aspire as will well. Will that be the, the case every year, or was just just a well, I mean, will ninth and tenth, will ninth graders take it twice a year is what I'm asking. That's the case this year. Yeah. Ninth graders will take it twice this year. Okay. Tenth graders will take it once, once. this year. Um, but we're unsure. Yes. Okay. Quite honestly. Yeah. Uh, you know, we were wondering, is that the, is that the, you know, the baseline the and then your, your growth opportunity or is that an implementation we have not heard um, yet from DPI? Andrew? Um, I'm pretty sure I know the answer to the question, but is there any, was there any statistical norming done to provide any kind of meaningful equivalency between WKCE scores and this, or is this just another do-over, move-forward point like so many other times? I, I, I think the attempt was made to help prepare us for the smarter balanced assessment, and I guess I would say the increased rigor and complexity. Uh, when they uh, realigned the WKCE scores a couple years back. I don't know if you, you recall that discussion where they, they, they basically they set the cut scores a lot higher than what they had done in the past. And so they were attempting to project what we would see as proficiency on the Smarter Balance Assessment, but uh, we can't say definitively because there's really been no linking studies or any kind of a link correlation analysis between the existing WKCE and the, well, the Badger exam, no. If, if someone at the state level had wished to, you could have normed a sample by having a, the same group of kids, kids take, take both. Mm -hmm. If you, yeah. mm -hmm. if there was a desire to do that by the powers that be, but it sounds like there was not. Yeah, and it could have been a funding situation they ran into. Sure. I, I don't know. You know, I can't speak to that specifically why why there hasn't been a, a correlation or a linking study done, but it, it just wasn't. Okay, thank you, mm -hmm. Michelle. I just um, wanted to just share a comment. The amount of work and effort being put in by our our team, um, both here at the district level in collaboration with the buildings has been extraordinary and what's what's challenging and our opportunity goes right back to what you were saying dr wagner is that because not all students have access and dragging and clicking for some students is second nature while others don't have those resources we continue to work um, to provide that i think is is of great concern to me Mm -hmm. um, and to all of us. And I think that that's why there's been extraordinary efforts and conversations and partnership 
um, with technology. We're very grateful for tech integrators mm -hmm. and, and for Stephen Miller, who is um, relentless at the State Department in terms of trying to get the resources that we need. Um, right now, our push is to really get some practice tests in because as we know, for those of us who've had children who've already you know, taken college entrance exams, you practice a lot. You go to Kaplan, you try a lot of things to get, it's, it's, it's test taking skills that have absolutely nothing to do with what you know and are able to do. So um, I, there's, it's been a, a hard, hard push and will continue to be. And then, of course, behind the scenes, it's it's the behind the stage doors is what's going on with Diane and her shop in terms of the capacity of technology to be able to manage this district wide without the whole system crashing. And I think that that's, that's a wonderful challenge and opportunity for us. And. Um, keep working hard with that and then of course the teachers and students and we can't forget them as well um, they're preparing they're preparing all the time so it's a it's a very um, big game changer for us mm -hmm. and we will be as ready as we can possibly be yeah. yes I mean we haven't even talked about the politics of the situation which is enormous I mean, the judgments that are going to be made in Madison on these test results, I mean, you have middle class families, uh, you have two year olds that are computer literate. Mm -hmm. We have kids that come to us in poverty when the first time they step in the classroom, that's the first time they've seen a computer. Yes. And we're being judged on all of that and in comparison to schools that have almost no poverty or almost no uh, ELL students. So, I mean, the, the politics of the situation is very troubling and we're gonna just have to see how that works. But I think that, to me, is a major concern. Andrew? Um, if our um, private schools receiving state voucher money, are they gonna have to do this com in completely the same or? Is it going to be a no. yeah, but the half of it or no. not, none of it at all? Um, we don't know. We don't know yet, but I think the push is to allow private schools to take whatever test they want to. So they would have to take a test. A test, right. And I'll talk more about that later. But no, I, that's kind of the push is that the state shouldn't force private school students to take the same test that the public school kids do. Even though, even though, and I'll bring this up now, Brad Carl, who was at the Legislative Advocacy Conference, who is in charge of the Value Added Institute at UW-Madison, recognized expert around the country on this sort of stuff, said, if you are going to compare students and compare schools, they all have to take the same test. Otherwise, there is no way of comparing students if they take different tests. Didn't, well, but didn't the Milwaukee voucher schools, I mean, they took WKC. They're taking WKC. They did. So they right. weren't given a choice of what, they had to take WKC. Correct. Correct. So right. they weren't given a choice. But that's so, going to change. So then the, the uh, I, I thought I heard somebody at the legislative conference talk about them taking smarter balance. Well. If things stay as they are, that would be the case. But we're yes. Things are shifting constantly. We're in a time of flux. Yes. yes. Okay. I, I have to make comment again on Mike's, Mr. Plekka's comment. I, I, th I thought of that too as we're sitting here. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy to make certain kids in schools look bad. Right. I mean, it could be. It's, it's a skeptical way of looking at it. Uh, just like uh, redlining neighborhoods became a self-fulfilling prophecy that those neighborhoods became even uh, more detrimental in, in terms of what they had and offered. And uh, yeah, I, I, this is a, you know, I, I don't know whether somebody is being mischievous as they've set this up this way to, and again, I, one could argue perhaps I'm a little paranoid, but I do believe uh, there is an effort to uh, uh, knock uh, public education and privatize education. Just so. because you're paranoid doesn't mean that somebody isn't following you. 
It could be I mean, one could be paranoid for good reason. Right. Right. But I would argue that we're getting these kids as four Ks, and they don't have to take Smarter Balance until third grade. So we have four years to get, to get them computer ready mm -hmm. for this test. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that, I mean, obviously it's much easier if you're a computer native at 18 mm -hmm. months, you're clicking around. Mm -hmm. But I still think these are skills that we should be able to have our kids ready. I mean, right now we're scrambling to catch up, sure. but in the long run, yes. we should have something in place so that our third grade students are not deficient in computer skills mm -hmm. when they take some. It down. shouldn't be a new experience for those kids. Exactly. Right. Well, right. well, no, but it's, like it's, it's not something you have to practice. You know, I mean, it's something no. that you can gain right. with a certain amount of time, yep. you know, but, exposed but, to. Yeah. Right. But I, I, 20 I like hours it. versus yeah. 100 for some kids. I mean, I still think you can. I, I do like to compare it to getting a driver's license, though, in the sense that I, I think our teachers are doing a wonderful job of preparing our kids uh, with the, the knowledge that they need and the skills that they need to be successful. But you would never think of having a 16-year-old walk in and take the written test, but then not get any on-the-road experience. So my, our, my concerns around this assessment are primarily related to the interface itself right. and just kids being familiar with how to use the different tools because every one of these testing interfaces is a little bit different. And so, you know, if a kid has more experience driving, they can probably move from car to car a lot easier. And so some of those kids that come from homes where they've had a lot of technology background will be at an advantage to kids who maybe don't have as much experience on the computer, even in the time that we've given them, and we're absolutely going to do that. The other thing, you know, our new to the country kids um, are going to be at a, at a disadvantage as well, depending on what kind of health computer background that they have. I, I was going to say not to not to be pessimistic about a state mandated um, tool, but we'll, um, in Green Bay and everywhere, well, it's well, it's true. We will have some of our kids from. 4K up until they take this. There are <clears throat> schools where we will have had all, virtually all of the kids in Green Bay from 4K through 3, and there will be schools where I bet a good third of them will not have been with us yeah. that, will not have been within Wisconsin that, that whole, whole time, yeah. which is a huge difference i think I, I i agree with brendan i think for the for the kids that we have i think absolutely. we'll have them ready to do this mm -hmm. absolutely right. but mm -hmm. again unlike um unlike private schools which i guess it's neither here nor there if they don't have to take this particular test um we of course take everyone who comes in and that includes yeah, as you said, people have not been in the country or people have not been in Wisconsin and haven't been exposed to this kind of test, et cetera. Yeah. What, um, and, and I shouldn't keep going on about this. A couple of years ago when I was at Tank, uh, Tank um, the principal told me in the fifth grade there were less than a handful of kids that had been there mm -hmm. kindergarten through fifth grade. Mm -hmm. That's a heck of a turnover, and I don't believe Tank is that unique compared to many of our other schools, back to our issue. We're, we're certainly, you can only do the best you can at your point in time, and we're certainly yeah. hoping other schools within the state are able to step up to the plate as we are, uh, and I don't know about other states, but at least in our state, we hope we can uh, accomplish that, so, uh, to help these kids, and, and help society. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Stephen, are you done? I am done. Any, any other questions for Stephen? Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation and for all your work. And with the rest of your staff, thank them for us. And there's much more work ahead. Absolutely. And thanks for sending us the PowerPoint. That was helpful. Yes. Right. Yeah, okay. and those are some of those questions are kind of hard. <laughs> I took the, they were, I, This is not, I mean, this is a serious. I, I used it. 
you send out, uh, <laughs> you send out some instructions and I couldn't figure out how to find out. Oh, I think we can. Let me just check in. Yeah. Well, then, I may be just All right. As a matter of transition, I'll share with you uh, next steps. Uh, we talked about uh, learning reports moving forward and, and possibly taking another step into additional assessments for our next one. Uh, Board Member Blaka and Jeffries and I will be meeting Wednesday, uh, this Wednesday, uh, to discuss again uh, additional items. So if you have suggestions, please send them our way. Uh, but we'll also be talking about school monitoring reports and what that looks like. So uh, we'll be able to get out in the update at the end of the week uh, in anticipation of where we'll be going for the rest of the months. Okay? Good. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much, Stephen. Don Mark certainly substantiates why we we're investing so much money in our technology. Well, I'm ready. I mean, this we're is ready. Diane, thanks to you and your staff, too, for all the tech work in the schools. Yep. You done? Right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Next, uh, we have our superintendent's update. I'll turn it over to Dr. Winfield. Gosh, we're going to start with the calendar. Thank you. Um, December 1st, it's right around the corner. Teaching and learning work session, 530 here in the boardroom. Also that same time, immediately <coughs> following the organizational support work session meeting. And then we have our December um, intercity uh, student council meeting here in the boardroom at 7 a.m. on December 11th. So that is our favorite time when we get to get up at four in the morning to meet with our favorite <laughs> students. But it actually is always a very important meeting for us and I much appreciate all the participation we have and feedback we get from students. Um, then we have our regular board meeting December 15th. Then the district will be in recess from December 24th through the 2nd of January with classes resuming on January 5th. So it'll be a, a nice long break for our students and perhaps we can get those iPads and laptops into uh, hands of some of our kids to practice <laughs> seriously over the holiday break and that might be helpful for them. So that is the calendar. Um, then I have one discussion item, and I know that Lori Blakesley is providing me with a little help on this. I don't know if you want to do it first or if I can give a little intro to this. Okay. Tomorrow is a very important day for our media. Um, November 18th is the day that members of the media will be joining a tour at the renovated Preble High School Field House. And I, you've been invited, obviously, at noon on Tuesday. We actually had a preliminary tour last Friday. The staff went and, and toured, and Lori and I joined I them. Was there today? To, to yeah. look at the changes and I, uh, in the field house. And I think that what was really important to me was the recognition of, uh, it was a coming together of all the work and, and sacrifice that people had made to make this a really great place for kids again. And I think that um, talking with staff that day and really um, talking with community, I had a community member talk to me today about it. Often weeks don't go by when people talk to me about the result of the Preble fire and how people came together quickly and how, how the restoration company played a significant role moving very quickly and providing a great place again for kids. So I, um, and the community. I mean, it's it's a it's it's very attractive. And Lori did some a little photographing for us as kind of a preempt, yeah, and she was sending a little Twitter feed. I don't know if you did that yet with the media. Yeah, that's right, yeah. She's going to put it out so that they know what's to come. It looks great. It really does. So it I it mean, really. The staff is pleased. And yeah. Well, and when I looked and saw all you, this is a hardwood maple floor. And that when you see and think about the magnitude of having, there were piles and piles of wood, yeah. and you go, wow. So anyway, they did a wonderful job. So you can see where we've been and where we went.
<coughs> Sometimes it's easy to quick, uh, quickly forget what it was and, and the amount of work that went in it. And I look out at the audience and I see Mike Stengel and I know Mark Smith was intricate in being there all the time and Alan Wagner on point and of course the entire Preble team. So well, when I talked to Dan Rutsky today, he said, you know, it would have been easy for staff to just sit and complain and moan about what they couldn't do or schedule. He said, everyone just, all right, this is it. And they adapted, and mm -hmm. the FIAT classes adapted, and the sports teams adapted. And well, we have a Preble student yep. here. I don't know what your thoughts might be. Um, it's really nice how they all came together, and we actually worked around the fire instead of just, like Mr. Blanco said, complain about it. It's really nice to see everyone coming together. Mm. Thank you. That's my celebration yep. for tonight. And I have no action items, so I'm complete. All right. Thank you, Dr. Reinfeld. Next, we'll move to our legal update. And this is... While she's in uh, coming to the table, I, I the other piece is Lori Blakesley, and I should have mentioned her, <laughs> who was the communication expert um, getting information to families, to media, and the whole group. So I want to publicly thank you, Lori, as well. Good evening. The legal update for today is an update on legislation that was passed the last legislative cycle, and that is the Technical Excellence Scholarships, or TES, for an acronym. The TES scholarships are modeled on the Academic Excellence Scholarships, which we currently have in place in the district. And the legislature passed legislation that will award scholarships to students in the technical education field to attend a Wisconsin Technical uh, College for up to six <coughs> semesters for a total of $2,250 per semester. That excludes the summer session, so those are the fall and the spring sessions. Okay. And as the memo details, there are a number of uh, requirements for a school district to be eligible for this coming school year to award these scholarships to their students. The um, board will be asked um, in the coming months by the district to adopt a policy so that we have the necessary foundation in place so that we can award the scholarships to the students. We will be eligible for the same amount of TES scholarships as we are as for the academic um, excellence scholarships. A student may only receive one of the scholarships. They can't receive both. But that it's a great opportunity for our students to receive these scholarships. So as we um, come forward in the, in the next few months, we'll be asking you to approve or adopt a ranking system for eligible students. and. The Higher Education uh, Board has set forth model, a model ranking system. So we will be discussing here in the district whether we want to adopt that ranking system or develop our own. We will be asking you to have a policy as to how long a student must have attended a school here in the district to be eligible for the scholarship. We'll be, um, we have a grading system, a grading policy in place, which is a prerequisite to be eligible for the scholarships. And we'll have to have a policy on, that describes our tie-breaking procedure. Unlike the AES scholarship, the technical education scholarship, grades are only a tiebreaker if the points amassed under the recommended ranking system are, are the same points for students. And then the grade point average for a student in the career and technical education classes a student has taken matter, not the overall grade point average. And what um, the Higher Ed Board is recommending is that we adopt similar policies to what we already have in place for the Academic Excellence Scholarships. Do we have a limit to the number of scholarships we could, that could be awarded to Green Bay kids? It's the same number of Academic Excellence Scholarships, and I don't know how, how many offhand we have. I apologize. Okay. It's based on a formula and how big our... There isn't like one per high school or necessarily? I think it could be more than one per high school. Okay. Mm -hmm. right. It's based on your student population. Okay. Hmm. Very cool. So look for some new policies coming forward in the coming months. Any questions? We have to have this ready to go by... February 1st. Okay. So... Um, and then, but then the 
submitting the names of the students happens at the at fe by the February 25th we have to submit the names of the oh, students. Oh, it's by February. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So we'll be seeing those policies next month probably. Yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. We're, we are working as we speak. Okay. Good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Next, we'll move to our Intercity Student Council report, and I'll turn that over to Lokeen. Thank you. Um, for high school news, Preble High School's Manny Meyer was named Girls Golfer of the Year by the Press Gazette for her accomplishments at regionals recently and her accomplishments in her high school career. Um, Sydney Onesi and Katie Warpinski were also honorable mentions. Um, Preble student Rosalyn Soa is also aiming for her first state title in swimming. She is competing in the 200-yard and 100-yard free freestyle. Uh, East High School's Caitlin Holzer and Liam Leverett had been named uh, scholar, uh, Scholars of the Week by the Press Gazette as well. Uh, Caitlin Holzer, if you don't know, she's the only national uh, merit yes. semifinalist in Green Bay. And um, Jeremy Kivett from East High School was also named um, the 2014 Green Bay Packers Community Quarterback Award. Um, he received $1,000 worth of scholarship money. Um, he accepted this award at the government and government ethics and business and government luncheon on the on last Thursday, the 14th. Um, Elliot Christensen from Avisone Technologies, which is a web design and web solutions company, um, visited the East Co-op class, Cooperative Education, as part of the Junior Achievement Excellence in Ethics Day, which is in conjunction with the business and government ethics day. And Green Bay West um, Marketing Co-op visited California as part of the trip, and they also visited Google. Um, for upcoming events, Preble High School is hosting their Seven Brides with Seven Brothers musical, which is on 21st and 22nd. They also had their first showing last week. And I believe East High School's Track the Musical is also having a show. And that concludes the report. Yes. Any questions for Will Keith? All right, thank you. Yeah. We'll look forward to our meeting at, yeah. on the 11th, mm -hmm. the Intercity Student Council. <clears throat> All right, next we have uh, our legislative liaison report. I'll turn that over to Mike. Thank you, Brenda. Um, you have an attachment that includes uh, a bunch of attachments from the Legislative Advocacy Conference on Stevens Point. Uh, and if anyone wants printouts of some of those, uh, San let Sandy know. She has the hard copies if, it's, if someone is going through that and wants a copy of one of the presentations. Um, I attended along, with Brenda was there, uh, Michelle, and also Lori, so I mean, anyone else, uh, if you want to uh, chime in at any time. I'm just going to talk briefly about a couple of things that came up at the conference, some of the comments made by some of the speakers, and then I'm going to update you on what's going on in Madison with the governor and the legislature with educational issues and, and kind of, I think, where we're headed. Um, the first person I want to mention was our first speaker, Dr. Julie Mead, who is an educational leadership professor at UW-Madison, and she's done extensive research on public schools and the impact of vouchers. Um, she talked a lot about the fact that public education is mandated in the Wisconsin Constitution. And one of the things she talked about is, what does it mean to have a right to an education when a voucher program is in place? At what point, if any, does the state's funding of private education subvert its constitutional obligation to provide adequately for public education, thereby converting a child's right to an education to merely the right to shop for one? Um, I just want to share one more, a couple, and she talked about, there's a couple of books out there that really show that public schools do outperform private schools and outperform charter schools. Uh, her research and uh, other research shows that public schools where poverty rates were under 10% scored the highest or among the highest in the world. In public schools where the poverty rates were 10 to 25% of the student body scored among the top few nations in the world. Her final thoughts constitutional obligation of state legislatures to fund and nurture the common public school is paramount and may not be subordinated to a legislative desire to subsidize the private choices of individual parents. You can have a public school system without choice, 
but you cannot have a choice program without a healthy public school system. State constitutions have established that children have a genuine right to a quality education, not merely the, not merely the privilege to shop for one. And if we are going to redefine the public in public education, we need to do so mindfully after a full debate on, on what is at stake and what justifies the change. Um, I had mentioned before uh, Bradley Carl, who is Associate Director for Policy at the Value Added Research Institute at uh, UW-Madison, and he made a couple of points. He said, all potential measures of school performance have technical and policy trade-offs that must be balanced in making decisions. Choices about which measures to use for holding schools accountable and how to weigh them relative to one another should always be driven by the attended uses of the data. And then he, what I had mentioned before, the fact is, is that if you are gonna be giving assessments and comparing groups of students, students must all take the same assessment Otherwise, the comparisons are invalid. Um, and then uh, just one brief comment from uh, Lori Pinsono, who's director of the Office of Educational Accountability at the Department of Public Instruction. And one point she made that kind of stuck out to me is that the intent and purpose of the accountability system should drive the design. In other words, what, what do you want to accomplish by your accountability. Um, one more thing, um, one of the speakers on Common Core uh, was Jim Morgan, Vice President of Wisconsin Manufacturers and Commerce. Uh, and that's an interesting group which has generally supported conservative causes, but they are huge supporters of the Common Core. And, um, and he talked about why Common Core consistency from district to district and state to state, accountability, results in the ability to improve where needed, competitiveness, preparation for global marketplace, innovation, creative teachers, reaching students in creative ways, and quality, benchmark, and more rigorous. And he said Common Core has given local communities a common purpose, the states a common goal, and the country a tool to ensure our long-term success. So obviously that is an organization that wants to make sure that our students are well prepared for the workforce when they leave school. Uh, any questions, or Brenda or Michelle, any comments on the conference? Okay. I thought, I thought it was very good. It covered a lot of, a lot of ground. A lot of the issues that are facing us right. in the next few right. months, so it was good. I think that the piece that, that people may not necessarily be paying attention to is um, a discussion around workforce development and actually the fact that in the state of Wisconsin, we do not have the physical bodies that will be needed in the future to fill the work force and I think that's something to really think about I think the other message behind that is the recognition that we need to educate each every child every day to be college career and community ready because at least that will move uh, somewhat forward as a state but it's very concerning when you start to look at the retirees and and where the work the numbers of, of youth are and and young people and if they're staying or going and leaving the state and so forth. So that to me is the kind of discussion sometimes that we need to have with our policy makers around the fact that the work that we're doing, and I, I see we're gonna have a little more discussion around career and tech ed and some of those pieces, it becomes paramount that we educate and provide that personal pathway for each child and, and hopefully have a community where students want to stay after they after they graduate and work here with us as well. So. Uh, point of clarification, uh, you indicated that, if, forget your exact wording, uh, there aren't enough uh, students to fill the needs that are out there. 
does that mean there are enough students trained to fill the needs that are out there, or there are not enough number-wise students, period, to fill bodies. Fill bodies. 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 That's what Todd, Todd Berry was there from the Wisconsin Taxpayers Alliance, and he said a lot of this talk about jobs really, we'll see, I think he said it was foolish, because he said you can't talk jobs when there aren't people to take the jobs. You know, talk about, well, we're going to add this many jobs, and he showed the population trends in Wisconsin. He said there aren't going to be people to take those jobs. He said unless things change. Mm -hmm. Will it become like the UP? Well, that would never I mean, be there's more out-migration, particularly of college grads, than there is in-migration. You know, the, the, the whole aging, he had some charts, the aging of the population. You know, and the 18 that to 24 year olds, 18 to 24 year olds is over the next 20 years is like this. And the, what is it, the 55 to 64 and plus is going like that. And that's obviously there's some real budget implications of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then um, some of the, what's going on politically in Madison right now? Um, the governor is, in, and some legislators are talking about obviously expanding the statewide voucher program, which now is at a thousand students. Uh, Scott Fitzgerald, who's the Senate Majority Leader said he thought next year he could see maybe 9,000 vouchers. And this is outside of the Milwaukee and Racine programs. Um, there is some talk of totally taking the cap off. And then also there's some talk of now the um, income eligibility is 185% of poverty. In Milwaukee and Racine is 300%. I think there's some talk about taking the income cap off completely. Um, and then also there's a continued discussion with the Common Core. Um, and I just read something today that the legislature in January wants to address vouchers, accountability, and the Common Core in January. So uh, that's something that um, I know we've had some discussions here on our approach and a lot of the organizations um, that value public education, WSB, uh, at the School Administrators Alliance, uh, uh, WEAC, um, I think they're all um, talking about what kind of impact we can have, but the political climate in Madison is very difficult. Um, to have um, concerns of public education addressed. So uh, I think that's something. And um, Tony Evers um, released his um, proposed budget for the Department of Public Instruction. He is proposing a 2.5% increase in state aid in the first year of the budget and a 4.9% increase in the second. That amounts to a $453 million increase in general school aids. He also proposed a $160 million increase in categorical aid, and he would like to boost the revenue limits for districts by $200 per pupil in the first year and $204 per pupil the second. Um, lest people forget, about five years ago, that was about $280 per student and it would, and at that, that time, I think state law said that that should increase by the consumer price index. And of course, that was all done away with. So that's kind of what, and um, legislators, uh, those who spoke out about it, were not very receptive to Tony Evers' proposal. Um, although I do um, give Luther Olson credit and he said, you have to give DPI credit for asking what they think is needed for public education. He said, it's our job and the governor's job to decide what we can afford. But there are also um, some other comments that weren't as receptive. So um, that's kind of the update right now. Uh, anybody has any questions, that concludes my report. Do you have any good news, Mr. Black? Yes, yes I. I <laughs> I don't like giving you um, bad news, but that's kind of the status reality. of things. Right it's now. our reality right now. That's reality. All right. Thank you, Mike. 
Next is district events. I don't know if there's anything anyone wants to announce that's going on in the district. Can I Go just ahead. share something? Um, what we've been trying to do with Partners in Education, which is an arm of the chamber, is meet at various sites um, and businesses. And last week, West High School hosted Partners in Education. And it was very nice to be able to share the great work that's being done there um, around Bayling Manufacturing. So after the meeting, we had a tour with um, business partners and fellow superintendents and really looking at how we leverage partnerships in our community to elevate and educate all children to be college, career, and community ready. It was very well received. Higher education folks were there. Someone from the medical college was there to really look at some of the good work that is going on here in our schools. Um, we have so much to offer, and I think the technical education piece is, is often unique to public education, and we can't lose sight of that. Um, we do extraordinary things, and I know we'll be talking a little more about some of the offerings we also have in that area as well coming up here shortly. So it's just one more piece, but it was a very, very well-received and important meeting, I think, for us. All right, thank you. Next, we'll move to our systems reports. First, we'll be teaching and learning, facilitated by Katie Mulley. Thank you, Brenda. We had several. We have several action items, and they were all thoroughly discussed two weeks ago at our work session. And I will begin with. I move that the redesign of the National Automotive Technician Education Foundation slash Auto Technician Lab, as presented, be approved. Second. Did you reverse it? No, I did. Oh. That's very good. Second, but that's oh, okay. okay. <laughs> you raised your hand and took away your turn. That was pointing, really. <laughs> All right. Are there any questions before we vote? All right. I just wanted to mention that I had the pleasure of touring the tech ed department at East last Friday, an area of the building I didn't even know existed. And it was really, um, Lori was very gracious, and along with staff and Richard, to see what the plan is. It seems very well designed to maximize the current space and um, to provide a, a, a adequate teaching space for, for the vehicles. And um, I understand there might be some issues as they start to uncover and take down some walls. And I'm sure that Mike has, has factored that into the budget figure, I'm hoping that there's some accommodating of unforeseen that always goes with the renovation. But I, I think it's very well conceived and a good program. That's another wonderful example of our community partnering. Exactly. Um, it was a very, very good discussion. Exciting a couple weeks ago. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right, Sandy? Aloy? Aye. Warren? Aye. 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 I move that the legislative liaison and other board representatives policy as presented be approved. Second. Sandy? Becker? Aye. 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 Carried 6-0. I move that the board policy adoption review policy as presented be approved. Second. Sandy? Warren? Aye. Becker? Aye. Becker? Aye. 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 Carried 6-0. And I should also preface this that the recommendations that we had made at the last meeting were uh, changed in incorporated into the policies. I want to thank Melissa and Sandy for getting that done. All right. I recommend that the board member compensation and expenses policies as presented be approved. Second. Sandy? Right here? Aye. 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 Carried 6 Recommend that the regular board meetings policy as presented be approved. Second. Sandy? Aye. 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 Aye
I recommend that the agenda preparation and dissemination policy as presented be approved. Second. Sandy? Lillian? Aye. Warren? Aye. Blanca? Aye. Franz? Aye. Wagner? Aye. Becker? Aye. Carried 6-0. I move that the board work sessions policy and the procedures for appointing board members to preside over work <coughs> sessions, meetings rule as presented be approved. Second. Sandy? Becker? Aye. Blanca? Aye. Wagner? Aye. Franz? Aye. Warren? Aye. Warren? Aye. Aye. Carried 6-0. I move that the public participation at board meetings policy as presented be approved. Second. Sandy? Maloney? Aye. Warren? Aye. Franz? Aye. Becker? Aye. Blanca? Aye. Wagner? Aye. Carried 6-0. I move that the agenda format exhibit be re repealed. Second. Sandy? Second. Oh. Sandy? Wagner? Aye. Maloney? Aye. Warren? Aye. Franz? Aye. Blanca? Aye. Becker? Aye. Carried 6-0. And that concludes our report. All right. Thank you, Katie. You're welcome. Next, we'll move to organizational support, and that'll be facilitated by Chris Swagner. Uh, thank you. Uh, the first item is uh, recommendation. Uh, Alan will talk about it here. Would you like me to make the recommend motion first and talk about it? Do you want to talk about it first? Um, no, I think why don't you make the motion? You can make the motion, then we can discuss it. We'll discuss. Right. Yes. Okay. Uh, the, the recommendation is that uh, the resolution authorizing temporary borrowing in the amount not to exceed $10 million pursuant to section 67.12, parentheses A, parentheses A1, Wisconsin statute be approved. Second. Again, this is our annual time to come to short term borrowing, and the documents that uh, you, you have at your uh, chair tonight is the, uh, is the resolution that goes with that. And again, our interest rate is going to be 0.79%, uh, which is a good a good rate. Uh, and again, as the $10 million is needed because of the the way the cash flow works with school districts, uh, we get our taxes seven months into the school year in January, and our state aids are split out 15% in September, and then 25, 25, 35% is in the last month of the school year. So, a lot of school districts do short-term borrow, and again, the borrowing. At one time was up to $28 million, and that has been reduced to the $10 million by, again, um, utilizing and increasing the fund balance over the years to not have to, uh, to borrow as much as we had in past years. Uh, Alan, I, I think you explained it, but I guess I, I'd like you to amplify it a little bit more for the public in particular. There's an article in the paper not too long ago about how districts in this area, including our district, of course, were sitting on a lot. Of, the implication is that they're sitting on a lot of money. Where is that money? And if all that money is there, why, why are we borrowing it? And again, I know you explained it one way, but if you could do it one more time, I'd appreciate it. Even with the fund balance uh, of the amount we have, um, Without having the fund balance, we would have to short-term borrow additional dollars. And again, the fund balance is there to, not only does it help us get a, a second highest bond rating in the entire, you know, entire Moody's calculation, um, but it does offer the ability to, uh, in, in this case, we use some of the fund balance to, to do some of the construction projects outside the referendum. Um, fund balance is there for, um, unknowns that may happen. If a boiler would break down during the middle of the school year, we would use the fund balance to do those emergency type uh, uh, type expenditures. But really what it does, and again, because of the state and when we get our dollars, uh, get our funds, uh, we need to have that fund balance. So we do not have to borrow $28 million during the year and have that interest expense you know, as part of our budget. And those are dollars that are not then utilized for students. I, I guess I, I thank you, and I'd like to point out, you know, we're often compared with businesses, and uh, in, a, in a business, you know, you, you might feel comfortable borrowing at five percent because you're making ten percent on your on your money. Uh, we don't make money in in the public sector that when we borrow. The interest rate is what we pay. We're not making additional money on that, that particular uh, loan. 
And uh, so a actually, you know, at least in my opinion, what the district does and, and you've been doing, Alan, is uh, very sound business practice based yeah. upon our circumstances. Yes? Um, I um, figured out just for a, for illustration purposes too, not that, not that I think it's a good idea to, I think it's overdone to compare, uh, well, what if, what if the school district was a, a household budget? I think it often is distorted, but I think it's, I think it's pretty relevant here. Um, if you took a, if you took an income earner of $40,000, the way we get our money would be, and I'm saying monthly instead of quarterly, but it would be somewhat similar to first three months of the year, you get $2,000 a month, and then then you get 3300 for the next several months, and then right at the very end, um, right at the very end, you get $5,000 for a, for a couple of months is roughly the proportions there, which is, probably probably not something that people you owe money to are gonna just say oh yeah fine we'll just uh we'll just catch you in in june when you get the rest of your money so and again comparisons to cities and counties you know all the cities cities and counties their beginning of the year is january 1st so you don't see counties and cities have to do the short-term borrowing because they get their tax money right away in the first month and they're you know, and then they're able to gain interest revenue in school districts. We just do not have that ability to do so based on what the state funding is. Sandy? Anchor? Aye. 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 Carried 6-0. Alan, you need signatures for someone afterwards, right? I will be looking for signatures, yes. Okay. Autographs. Thank you. Thank you. Next under uh, human resources, um, first recommendation is uh, that the 1.0 FTE electronic system supervisor position, 12 month and a salary group 11, 67 uh, K plus to 79 K plus for the 2013-14 uh, rates. Uh, that the associated job description as presented be approved. Second. This is a new uh, job description, a new position, um, which we feel is necessary because of the complexity of all of the electronic um, systems that we have. Um, all of these systems are related to school and building safety and student, and student staff safety, and um, we believe we need a person in a management level to oversee them. Could you, could you uh, differentiate for us the difference between this and what goes on in technology so it's not uh, confused for the public, it's not a confusing issue for the public? Right. I, um, these are systems that are tied directly to the buildings. They are the, um, the phone systems, the um, alarm, alarm systems, even systems that are on boilers that alert to um, problems, the, yes, the, the, badges. The, the badge, the which is really a security and yeah. ID system. Mm -hmm. And all of these things are run through tech, by, um, by technology. Um, Nick Marta was here and he could probably explain them a little bit better because he knows the, them inside and out. Um, but because they're tied so much to the buildings, this person, Nick, would report uh, to Mike Stangel. And you know, I, I know that they work closely with technology, but in most places, this individual is not in technology, but is usually tied to facilities because that's they're, they're that's they're two different working. areas. Two different the areas. The focus yes. is really around safety, security. Mm -hmm. uh, Gene, can you or Mike explain uh, who handled this supervision in the past, and what necessitated the? push to have a full-time person in charge of this? Uh, in the past, this uh, the, the position was uh, not management, but the person who was responsible uh, is was Al Benke, who is now uh, in, you know, has left our district for another no. district. Okay. Um, the person now who would be responsible would be Mike Stangle. 
but he has such broad responsibilities that the level of detail okay. uh, that would be necessary for for him to know and to supervise on a day to day, day basis um, something that we and we hadn't filled Del Benke's position. Uh, we right. reorganized Re things. Reorganized that department, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. And this is a hands-on position. It's not a medical. It's both supervisor, supervisor and hands-on because yeah, right. the department isn't isn't very big. There's two people, but um, th this person has a great deal of responsibility. Not you know, it's when the systems are installed, but then there's constant upgrading and maintenance. Yeah, and I, I, the other piece is, as it was explained to me, there's a huge potential for innovation. Mm -hmm. And what we have seen is that a person at this level, um, when you look at the industry standards, are really leading innovation mm -hmm. around these areas. So for example, and, and can, can really bring to the district some significant cost savings. Um, we talked about our radios, for example, and, and they have to have certain parts, components, upgrades, pieces of those. And we know that Nick has been able to save the district some significant cost savings every single year. And we're talking thousands of dollars. We're not talking $50 or anything, but even $50 would be great. But it's always looking at what's going on from a technology standpoint and really making sure we have the best that we can deliver for our students and, and so forth at a cost savings to the district. So I think I think it will benefit us, but there's that innovation piece that typically a person at this level possesses that you don't always get with just a technician um, who's doing an installation. This is not just about installation. It's always looking and thinking about about best practice and, and the, the facilities themselves. And um, upon Michelle's su uh, suggestion, we also added the responsibilities of education and, and training to the job description. So this person would be responsible for assuring that um, people are um, trained on all of the systems. Right, so as a, as a building principal or a clerical, mm -hmm. all of those people have to know if we're gonna change the bad system, the whole thing. So there's a lot of professional development around it as well. So. Anything else? Mm -hmm. All right, Sandy? Blanca? Aye. 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 Parker? Aye. Maloney? Aye. Warren? Aye. Franz? Aye. Carried 6-0. Uh, the next recommendation is that the employment of Nicholas Marto as electronic system supervisor 12 months at the district office at a salary of 74K plus, group 11, 94th percentile, prorated to 45K plus uh, for this school year, effective November 18th, 2014, as presented, be approved. Second. Nick's been with the district since 2009. And he also um, has a bachelor's degree from UWGB. How come we prorate to not this school year, but last school year? It should be prorated. Um, well, it says the 2013-14 rate. This, this school it, year. It, that is this school year. Well, actually, it was. No, the, this is 14 15. It's because the rates that the supervisors are still under until the board votes oh, later in the meeting are the old rates. Okay, all right. <laughs> so that will. So that'll change. Go to the 14 15. Yes. Okay. yes. Should have reordered the Good count. Yeah, reordered. We should have reordered the motion. So, <laughs> <laughs> so who do you have? To? Okay. Okay. All right, Sandy? Becker? Aye. Maloney? Aye. Franz? Aye. Wagner? Aye. Warren? Aye. Lecca? Aye. Carried 6 0. Congratulations, Nick. There's. <laughs> Congratulations. And next recommendation is that the employment of Amy Zellner as quality assurance specialist slash registered dietitian at Food Production Center, 12 months at a salary of 62K plus, group 12, 86 percentile prorated for the 2013-14 rates, effective on a date to be mutually agreed upon as presented be approved. Second. Amy uh, is a registered dietitian and she's currently working with the Milwaukee School District as a field supervisor. Um, she works with 25 schools in her area and four charter schools. 
and um, her family is from the Green Bay area, so Amy is looking forward to coming back to the area to work. Um, she ha has her um, nutritional science and dietetics and a minor in business from WGB, so she's also a GB grad, and she's enrolled in a master's program at Mount Mary. Well, that dietitian position has been vacant. It has been vacant. Yep. Mm -hmm. I think that's, a, that's, that's an important position. Yep. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, uh, perhaps uh, Ms. Marsh alluded to it. Um, what many people don't realize, uh, we do have many students out there that do require uh, a very restrictive offering uh, in terms of foods and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And um, there could be dire results for some of those youngsters if that wasn't followed. So right. this, this position is definitely needed if for no other reasons. Mr. Becker, do you have a question? Oh, no, I was just scratching. Oh. The district does get orders from physicians and has to follow physician orders regarding dietary restrictions for students. And so, you know, just like any large facility, we're preparing special menu items for students under doctor's orders. And so um, the registered dietitian understands this very clearly and um, can, can be the liaison between families and, and the student and the, and the um, health care provider. Right, Sandy? Warren? Aye. Parker? Aye. Blanca? Aye. 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 Carried 6-0. Next recommendation is that the limited term employment of Corey Vandertai as coordinator of extended learning district office at a salary of 42K plus 2013-14 rates effective November 26, 2014 through June 30th, 2015 as presented and be approved. Second. This is the prorated amount um, for the period of time that this um, the Corey will be working with us, and he's worked out a date with his district um, that's mutually agreed upon when he would start. So that's uh, that's why the date is the twenty sixth. Right, Sandy? Aye. 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 Carried 6-0. Next recommendation is that the transfer of Thomas DeBooth, computer technician, 12 month of district office at a salary of 59K plus salary group 14 hundredth percentile to assistant PC network manager slash computer technician, 12 months to, uh, at district office at a salary of 65 uh, K plus salary group 13, 100 percentile effective November 18th, 2014, as presented be approved. Second. This moves Tom up one uh, pay scale uh, to a higher level uh, computer uh, technician position, and um, it reflects the work that he has been doing and the work that he's capable of doing and the work that Diane Dersch um, believes is necessary in the, in the district. And Tom has been an employee with the district for a, a very long time. He started here in, two th in 1997 as a support technician. In uh, uh, if I'm hearing you correctly, it's, it's not that his position is receiving an increase in salary. His position was changed to, to have uh, more duties, and this is reflecting that, yes. that particular change. We, we have other people in this position. Um, so it's not a new position, but it's a, it's a higher level um, that an um, IT person would, would work in. All right, Sandy? Blanca? Aye. Franz? Aye. Becker? Aye. Warren? Aye. Maloney? Aye. Aye. Carried 6-0. Next recommendation is that a 1% salary increase for all steps for administrators retroactive to July 1, 2014, as presented, be approved. Second is the same salary increase in keeping with our educators. And um, it would include, as, as indicated, all administrators. Uh, questions? Cost, cost of living is what? Do you know, Ellen, or do you 1. know? 1.46 is the... 1.46% okay. is... So, uh, just for the general public, we're not in a position to keep up with cost of, of living for our employees, uh, let alone something beyond that. 
Right, Sandy? Aye. Moore? Aye. 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 Franz? Aye. Wagner? Aye. Becker? Aye. Carried 6-0. Next recommendation is that a 1% salary increase for all steps for managers and technical professionals retroactive to July 1, 2014 as presented be approved. Second. Any questions? All right, Sandy? Malone? Aye. Warren? Aye. Franz? Aye. Becker? Aye. Blackett? Aye. Wagner? Aye. Carried 6-0. Uh, next recommendation is that a 1.46 salary increase for executive assistance retroactive to July 1, 2014, as presented, be approved. Second. Any questions? And this is uh, uh, more than 1% because? This is, um, we are recommending the executive assistance receive the 1.46, same as the other um, AFSCME groups, uh, which would include the um, the clerical positions because the executive assistants, if we do one percent, would the gap would close between the clericals and the executive assistants. So this keeps them moving um, at the same same rate as the clerical staff. Sandy? Blanca? Aye. 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 Becker? Aye. Maloney? Aye. 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 Carried six zero. Next recommendation is a 1.46% salary increase for clerical food service maintenance monitors, noon hour supervisors, paraprofessionals, and, and trades retroactive to July 1, two th uh, 2014, as presented, be approved. Second. Sandy? Aye. 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 Carried 6 0. And next is that the salary increases for support staff as listed be approved. Second. I just wanted to point out that this year um, we're trying to bring all of the wage increases that uh, at, at about the same time. And we have a number of positions that are not part of a bargaining unit or administration or managers um, or technical, technical professionals. So what you have listed is um, other positions and the recommended salary increase that we feel is necessary. And in most of the cases, we're tying them to one of the units or to, to management. Then we have um, some Head Start positions. Those recommendations um, for the increases are tied to um, uh, recommendations from Sally Jansen, who closely monitors her budget and feels that these would keep the jobs competitive and they are within the Head Start budget. So you'll see the Head Start helper, the lunch hour, and then the Head Start substitute. And then uh, Lisa Bohm assisted with the rate, uh, rates for the Title I parent assistant, which is also <coughs> funded within her budget. And then our summer maintenance, we, you probably are aware, but I'll just um, update you that we hire in the summer uh, students from our district to do, to do some of the cleaning. And we haven't increased the, their um, base rate for a very long time. So we're recommending a modest increase of uh, 25 cents an hour. And then each year that the student returns, if they do return for another summer, they get an additional 25 cents added to their, their rate. And, and um, a few stay three years, but they usually don't get very far beyond um, the, the amount they might get come back two or three years at, at most. But all of the students we hire are our own. Gene, I just had a question on the Title I parent mm -hmm. assistance. I mean, that is, a, compared to the others, a significant increase. Did we feel that they were being underpaid? I mean, they went from 840 to 10? Yes, Lisa, Lisa felt that. And um, we're tying those um, Title I parent assistance. Our substitute rate is uh, for all of our clerical and our Paris is ten dollars an hour, and Lisa feels that this would uh, be a much much more um, competitive and actually a fair rate of pay. But she also knows that it doesn't mean that you know sh she will hire the number of people to stay within her budget at ten dollars an hour. Okay. Um, and and she closely monitors that, and and she has very strict reporting standards, so she, she and that she adheres to. Okay. Thank you. All right, um, Sandy? Becker? Aye. Blanca? Aye. Wagner? Aye. Franz? Aye. Warren? Aye. Maloney? Aye. Carried 6-0. That concludes my section. And then 
We have a consent agenda. I would entertain a motion for that. Oh, so moved. Second. Sandy? Maloney? Aye. Warren? Aye. Blackett? Aye. Franz? Aye. Wagner? Aye. Becker? Aye. All right, that concludes our meeting. We do have a closed session tonight, so I'll read that motion. <coughs> Special board meeting closed session has been scheduled for Monday, November 17th, immediately following the adjournment of the regular board meeting. Pursuant to Wisconsin Statute 19.851C, considering employment, promotion, compensation, or performance evaluation data of any public employee over which the governmental body has jurisdiction or exercises responsibility, and pursuant to Wisconsin Statute 19.851F, considering financial, medical, social, or personal histories or disciplinary data of specific persons preliminary consideration of specific personnel problems for the investigation of charges against specific persons except for paragraph B applies which if discussed in public would be likely to have a substantial adverse effect upon the reputation of any person referred to in such histories or data or involved in such problems or investigations to wit personnel matters. Pursuant to Wisconsin Statute 19.851E, deliberating or negotiating the purchasing of public properties, the investing of public funds, or conducting other specified public business whenever competitive or bargaining reasons require a closed session, more specifically to wit potential property contracts. And pursuant to Wisconsin Statute 19.851G, conferring with legal counsel for the governmental body who is rendering oral or written advice concerning strategy to be adopted by the body with respect to litigation in which it is or is likely to become involved, to wit potential litigation matters. The meeting will be begin an open session to consider the appropriate motion for a closed session so provided by law. So moved. Second. Sandy? Aye. 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 For more information or to obtain copies of this program, contact CESA 7 Interactive Learning Services at 920-465-5218.